Hey, thank you so much for um, for having me here virtually today. Um, it's wonderful to be able to be here and share some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and thanks for uh, to Ariel and Noah for organizing uh, the Neuro Academy. It's been a great opportunity for um, several people in my lab. Um, so today I would like to talk about uh, one of the large projects that we've been doing where we have um, BITS IEG in practice uh, to map the electrical stimulation driven, uh, to map electrical stimulation driven connectivity in um, a large population in humans. So I would first like to just introduce the, um, the uh, electrical stimulation a little bit. Um, so still electrical stimulation to map connectivity is not necessarily a new thing. Um, people have used this for a long time um, in living brains to actually map connectivity between different areas. And this is one example from um, 19, 1966, uh, way before a diffusion MRI was used, um, where a group stimulated the thalamus while having electrodes on the cortex in cats. And what you can see that within a few milliseconds after the onset of electrical stimulation, you can see this large voltage deflection um, that's induced by the um, by basically stimulating the thalamus and then measuring the response subsequent responses with a particular time delay of around six milliseconds in this case. And from these responses, after stimulation, you can infer conduction delays and different types of connectivity between um, different brain regions. And so we use something similar in humans who have uh, human patients who have electrodes implanted, for example, stereo EEG electrodes implanted for um, clinical purposes, such as epilepsy monitoring. These patients are in the hospital for um, about a week at a time, sometimes multiple weeks, while the neurologists wait for, wait for seizures. And during these time periods, we can ask them to participate in, um, in science and with single pulse electrical stimulation, um, we can deliver pairs of pulses to very brief of like 200 microsecond in duration to pairs of electrodes while we measure the, the while we measure in all the other electrodes. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to map connections between brain regions. So you can see that for in this, in this schematic, we would stimulate one electrode and measure in another pair. And there's this evoked potential that's very rapid after the onset of stimulation, followed by a slower, um, slower response as well. And so these single pulses, um, uh, as far as we've done them, they have not evoked any seizures in these patients. Um, and so they're much less likely to evoke seizures than any other types of stimulation. And so they are really like brief pings in different brain regions to map connectivity spreading between different regions. And so to give you an idea of what that looks like when we record the data, we can make a movie of the, where the size of the electrodes. So these are all the electrodes implanted in one of the patients. And we're going to stimulate one pair of electrodes here in gray. And then in the different colors, you will see how the voltage changes um, on average when we stimulate this pair of electrodes. So basic, and then there'll be a yellow, the screen will briefly turn yellow when the stimulation happens. I will first play the movie once um, as it goes, so you can have a look at it, and then I'll go through it a little bit slower, stopping at certain sections. And the size of the electrodes and the color indicates the polarity and the standard deviation with respect to baseline. So this is baseline activity, not much going on. There you saw the stimulation happening, followed extremely rapidly by some changes in the voltage in some of the electrodes, followed by some slower changes, and then a reduction again to baseline after about 500 milliseconds. So what you could see is that right after stimulation, you can see we're stimulating actually the in the pulvinar here, and we're measuring another electrodes, and you can see that within about 11 milliseconds, electro, um, like the voltage deflections in visual area, so we can establish connectivity between those regions. And then a little bit after that, you can also see parietal changes and many other changes at the same time, for example, lateral temporal, et cetera, followed by slower changes in many other regions. And so we are doing a large project to map the simulation driven connectivity across the lifespan in a large group of subjects. And so what I'll first show today is um, a new technique that we developed, uh, which we call basis profile curve identification to identify different motifs of connectivity. 
and then we'll um, apply this basis profile curve identification in human ventral temporal cortex to create connective field maps. And then I'll show you how we work with bids in this setting because we are developing a database um, with over 200 of these CCP data sets that we're planning to share at the end of the project. And then there'll be um, a demo where I'll show the um, a Jupyter notebook for the um, basis profile curve identification with bits data. So all the parts of the talk you'll see in practice and, and during the, you'll get to practice with during the demo. And so this will be a long talk. So I'd like to start out with acknowledgements rather than leave them to the end. So you can imagine there's a large group of people involved in these studies. My lab collecting the data in Mayo Clinic um, with the help of neurosurgeons and um, neurologists, my collaborators at the UMC Utrecht who, is, who are also collecting large data sets and as well at uh, Peter Brenner at uh, Washington University who's also collecting data sets. So this is a large effort between different groups, between UMC Utrecht, Franz Leit, and Peter Brenner, and our team, uh, where we're really trying to get as many uh, subjects as possible in bids to study the um, connectivity with simulation. And of course, thanks to my funding for funding this project. So basis profile curve identification to identify motifs of connectivity. Now, I just showed you the single pulse electrical stimulation, and there's different um, aspects of this. Some of these evoked potentials may be driven by direct cortical cortical connections, and some may go through subcortical nuclei. But one of the things that people have generally done when studying these kind of cortical cortical evoked potentials is to look at the uh, earliest response. In this case, you can see here the N1, or like the that people call this earliest negative deflection in N1 response, where the voltage goes down when you measure from the brain surface with surface electrodes. And this response is typical within about 50 milliseconds after the onset of stimulation, sometimes a little bit later. It can go up to 80 or 100, but generally it's an early evoked response. And that's, and we can also see this later response at around 200 milliseconds. And that's been one of the characteristics ways, one of the characteristic ways to look at these responses, to identify this response and then look at the speed of conduction delays or the direct connections between brain regions. However, um, when we think about electrical stimulation in brain networks, and we think about many different inputs from other areas arriving in one region, which we call a convergent approach. So we think at all the different inputs that we could measure with the surface electrodes from all these um, different types of you know, inputs surviving in superficial layers or deeper layers. It actually would make sense that we would see different response types based on different input types if they arrive at different types of layers. And so the um, so then if we use this convergent approach, which is the basis profile curve identification, we may actually be able to extract these types of connectivity profiles. In contrast, a divergent approach where we'd stimulate electrode, a one electrode pair and measure in many others would elicit could elicit different responses in two different sites just based on the site architecture in the two different sites while we stimulate the same site. If you want to do an all-to-all -all approach to map all connectivity, you really have to pick one feature in the data to look at different type all-to-all -all connectivity and do a more of a human connectome type approach, such as selecting the N1 response. You can also select the two different specific regions and study connectivity between those, of course. So there's different types of frameworks that we can use to understand electrical simulation better. And this, I want to focus on this convergent approach today um, because it specifically leverages the fact that we can have these intracranial data and we're measuring from one electrode, we stimulate as many other pairs as possible, and we can see whether it can help us learn about different types of inputs in a single region, which would be unique and complementary to many of the other techniques that have been developed. Are there any questions about this? I have a quick question. Um, are you, so this is referring to um, DCM, direct cortical stimulation, or DCS? So, 
Um, so we, with these intracranial electrodes, I am talking mostly about ECOG and stereo oh, EEG. Understood. Okay, sorry about that. That was my mistake. Yeah, so you can also apply, I think the techniques will also be applicable in other settings, but I will be focusing on intracranial EEG today. Thanks. Thank you. That's good to clarify early on. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so, so what we actually see when we look at one of the um, data sets, one of the sample ECOG data sets, so ECOG is electrocorticography measured from the brain surface, um, where, for example, two electrodes here are stimulated and one electrode here is measured. And so one pair stimulated with a single biphasic pulse, 200 microseconds in duration, and there's about three to seven milliseconds between the uh, pulses. And we measure the stimulation evoked voltage changes at a measurement site here in red. For example, on the parahippocampal gyrus. And in the raw data, you can see the stimulation evoked responses here. And when we average those across those trials, and we, when we stimulate the green pair, you can get a characteristic shape of that stimulation evoked response. And then when we stimulate a different pair here in purple, but still measure the same type, the same, uh, the same site, you get a different type of response. And then we average across these sites, you get a very, very different response shape. So these different stimulation pairs evoke different types of responses in the same measurement site on the parahippocampal gyrus. So we see what we just proposed in the data that different types of connections actually have different response shapes. And so let's plot the responses in one electrode here, the measurement site on the bottom from all these pairs. So we stimulate all these pairs and we measure in this single site. And then we can see clusters emerge visually. So for example, when we stimulate across these pairs indicated in orange, you can see that the, in the measurement site, we can see positive responses. Whereas when we stimulate the purple areas, we can see these negative responses, this one slightly different than those ones. And so we wanted to understand how we can identify these and cluster these types of responses algorithmically. So we're measuring in a single site and studying all the inputs to that single area. And the first thing we wanted to characterize is how similar the response shapes are to other simulations from the same electrode pair. So these are all the individual trials. And so in a normalized single trial, we can project it into all the other trials and compare basically how similar they are. And then we can also compare how similar this trial is to when we stimulate a different pair. So we can cross project all the trials into each other, whereas from a different or the same pair. And then we see these groupings emerge. So when we stimulate about 40 different pairs of electrodes and we project the trials either like into itself, self projections here or to other trials, you can see that these trials are very similar. Whereas other trials are basically, you get random distributions. And we can statistically test for these types of distributions and see which types of responses are similar and which is different and then do this across all pairs. So we get a matrix of significance for how similar each stimulation pair is to both itself and also other pairs. So we obtain a positively scaled significance matrix that has the single trials across basically cross-group interactions. And then we can use non-negative matrix factorization to cluster um, to cluster these with multiplicative up, um, update rules. And we can do that iteratively, such that we reduce the matrix until we have the off-diagonal elements between the components are smaller. You can see that this sigma reduces, which indicates that each of these components is relatively, relatively to a certain extent different from the others. And then we can take it, we take a winner take all approach. So we only say that one component, one stimulation pair can only be driven by one component. And then we have these basis profile curves from these stimulation pairs using a linear kernel PCA. And this is what 
we'll be using later today. So this is just walking briefly through the math. You don't have to understand every individual step, but just a global idea of that we look at the similarity between their responses to um, do this um, non-negative matrix factorization to get a set of components um, that characterize the basis profiles, the basic profiles within the stimulation of oak responses. And we'll be walking through this in the, in the demo. And so the result of this is a set of several basis profile curves. This can be like one up to three, however many we, um, um, how where we set our threshold, but if we set our threshold for the off diagonal elements to be less than one, we typically get like two to four. You can see that these responses have different shapes and we can map, and then we can map those back to the spatial representations and see how each, how each stimulated pair weighted onto each of these responses. So we have one measured site and we can see three of these clusters emerge. You can see that the, when we stimulated these green pairs, we evoked the top basis profile curve. When we stimulated the orange pairs, we evoked the bottom basis profile curve. When we stimulated the purple pair, the middle curve. And so we have a naive way to cluster these types of responses from the data. And when we go back to our first visual identification of these different responses, and we compare that to our method, it takes out, it, it, it extracts these basis profile curves naively. Are there any questions about uh, this? And just with the note that we'll be going through this in detail in the demo. Okay, we have some questions here in the audience. Um, <clears throat> hi, um, I saw there in in the uh, in the map that it's maybe temporal simulation or parietal sim simulation. I wonder if. Uh, there was any behavioral response regarding this simulation, or was it like sublinear, uh, sub thresholded simulation? So the, the patient had some other response or any kind of uh, response uh, regarding that simulation that you performed? So we, with this, uh, I mean, the, the single pulse stimulation is 200 microseconds in duration, and it's like four to six milliamps in, um, so it's four to six milliamps in, um, in amplitude. Um, and so this is relatively low. So we generally do not stimulate. Um, so in, in, in some cases, in, in many cases, like when we stimulate motor cortex with stereo EEG, we evoke little twitches. So we generally don't stimulate motor areas. Um, and so we generally steer clear of the uh, pre and post central gyrus when we stimulate. For other areas, um, we have not noticed any um, uh, any responses in that people told us about, like we feel this or we see that. But the stimulation is too brief and too small for that in general, except for motor cortex. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we have another one second. Hi, I was wondering if um, if you have any, any idea electrical simulation have different um, effect on excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons differently, and um, if the electrode um, orientation um, in terms of the um, layer um, organization has any um, influence on it. So that's a, a good a good question. Um, there's a lot of studies going on in that direction um, for um, single, so there's local effect versus distant effects. So the local effects, um, there's discussions whether it primarily affects the cell bodies versus the exons. So it's one of the, um, some of the modeling work or a lot of mod modeling work proposes that we may primarily be, fact be affecting the, um, uh, the axons and the dendrites rather than the uh, soma. So there's a combination of those effects that um, with these macro electrodes that are about one to two millimeters um, in diameter, 
um, are really difficult to tease apart. We basically have a combination of those, but we do see that we have large effects on the um, on the exons in addition to the um, uh, uh, to the potentially to the cell bodies, and that's what modeling work also focuses on. Is that we actually may be stimulating a lot of the um, the connections between the elect between the um, between the sites. So there's um, there's there's a multiple effects at the same time, but we think we primarily stimulate the um, whichever axons run by. Um, Dora, how do you choose the number of bases? So the number of bases is um, automatically decided. So we we basically the number of bases is um, uh, rolls out of the matrix um, uh, the matrix factorization. So when we iterate across those, we want the off-diagonal elements here to be um, uh, the sum to be, or the any any the sum to be smaller than one. But there's of course there's different types of criteria we could choose here for setting the number of off-diagonal elements. We generally take the sum to be um, uh, to be smaller than one. Thank you. Hi, so I'm wondering, um, maybe this is a naive question. Um, if you recorded, did you test like the the measurement site at different locations with the same stimulation pairs? I, I might hypothesize that there would be an interaction between measurement site and stimulation pair such that like stimulation pair A would have a different effect on measurement site x and measurement site z does that make sense um so if i am measuring in two different cytoarchitectonic areas would i get different basis profile curves is that the question yes um yes that's um so in the next session next in the next um in the next part of the you know where we in the next part we applied this across a group of subjects um, across a across the air, uh, electrodes in the collateral sulcus, and we overall find different profiles if we look um, basically on the fusiform gyrus, one area over. Um, but this is something that will have to be tested. So it depends on how far the electrodes are apart. So if they are on a different area or on the same area, um, and so if we have electrodes that are very close together, we often see very similar curves. But then when you cross a certain probably anatomical boundary, we see different types of inputs. So this is something that um, I'll show in the, I'll show, we have a preprint up on bioarchives that I'll show, I'll show in the next section. Great, thanks. All right, we got another question. Uh, hi, sorry if I missed this um, earlier, but could you please uh, explain again what the shape of these response profiles tell us about the type of the connection? like? What are the like the features of a connection that you're interested in that is related to the shape of these response profiles? So in this um, uh, convergent paradigm, it is the, the interpretation of um, of a field potential measured on the brain surface or even in the brain um, is extremely challenging compared to saying whether it's a a sink or a source below? Is it an excitatory or inhibitory response? Or is the source deeper? Or if you have just one measurement site, that's a source localization problem that is extremely difficult to solve. So you would have to have multiple laminar measurements or a more in-depth measurement to really say that with certainty. Um, what it allows you to do is to extract those profile curves. Um, and then Subsequently, we can relate those to the particular the particular anatomy and projection type of these types of connections. But from the um, uh, from the direct, how do we interpret these different waveforms? Um, we first have to make sure that we establish those different waveforms before and test whether they are there and whether they're different before we can start interpreting those. So the interpretation will, you know, will need some additional studies with a different scales and levels, comparing it to also anatomy, anatomical, um, anatomical studies. Any other questions from the room or Zoom? All right, I think you can continue, Dora. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, so this convergent paradigm allows us to distinguish these multiple input response shapes. And this is important because um, if we think about what other types of connectivity tell us, they tell us often that there is a connection or there's no connection. <clears throat> but whether these differ, whether, for example, the inputs from uh, from two different um, two different sites on a ventral temporal cortex, whether you can actually whether those are actually separately or differently driving this area is um, is difficult to extract if we only look at, for example, correlations or an fMRI resting state signal. So this can tell us much more about whether these projections are anatomically different or the same. And that's one of the things that um, Harvey Wang, my PhD student, uh, wanted to test. Um, because the ventral temporal screen integrates visual and memory and emotional inputs. And we wanted to understand uh, what type of inputs the collateral sulcus actually receives. Um, because it's involved in the perception of places located. I mean, so we selected a, um, and it can be modulated by many of these types of higher order processing. And so we selected these recording electrodes in a group of five patients. You can see here the inferior view of the brain. Here's the anterior side, here's the posterior side. So here's visual cortex. Um, the collateral sulcus is indicated here. And here you can see the positions of the stereo EEG electrodes um, rendered in the middle of the brain. So these are placed at depth. Um, and so I'll be um, also showing some of the visualization um, issues that we face when we um, work with this type of recording rather than a surface, uh, rather than only at the surface. And so we know that these sites receive many different inputs already from anatomical uh, people, like um, the Van Assen Atlas establishes all the different inputs that these uh, areas in the inferior temporal cortex get. And so it's a perfect test case to see whether they cluster. Um, and so first in an individual subject, we have a collateral sulcus site. And we run our basis profile curve identification over the first 500 milliseconds of the response. And we can see from this site that three shapes emerge. And then we look at the spatial representation of the stimulated electrodes. Um, we see that the um, dark blue sites are located in the hippocampus. And we label our electrodes according to the Destrio atlas um, and also uh, several other anatomical atlases. And they also, so that stimulation comes from the hippocampus. Um, you can see that the um, cyan shape, which is very different from the dark blue one, originates when we stimulate the amygdala. And then when we're stimulating the insula, we see more of the purple shapes. But the, we can actually, like in this rendering, it's really difficult to tell that these purple electrodes are in the insula. So, or, so we can also show the slices. And we developed um, a seek view package where we can easily slice for um, around electrodes with certain thicknesses so that multiple electrodes get picked, get basically shown in one slice. And you can see here that again, that the dark blue sites are in the, um, are in the hippocampus, whereas the cyan sites here are in the amygdala. So this is a slice where this is anterior, this is posterior, this is the anterior part of the, um, the, temporal, the temporal lobe. Sagittal view, here you can see the anterior part of the temporal lobe, cerebellum, posterior. I have a quick question. Have you done this um, specifically uh, in what cohort of patients? Uh, so have you done it in lesion brains? We have also done this in lesion brains, uh, but for this study, we excluded patients with large lesions because um, everything seemed to be extremely different and changed. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, um, so that's this next step. Once we have these types of, we first have to have the basis profile curves to then clip out a connection and see basically in the lesion brain, whether that changes the, um, that particular profile curve from the mm -hmm. related to that area. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. And so, um, so if we show these slices, we can show some of these deeper sites like the hippocampus and the amygdala better, but we still have an issue looking at the, um, uh, the other electrode sites. So one of the, we pull one of the tricks from the, um, from the <laughs> fMRI literature and we assign or all the electrodes that you can see here to one of the um, cortical surface nodes if they're within a certain distance. And then we can inflate the brain. 
And so here you can see the when we inflate the brain and we snap the stereo EEG electrodes to different sites, we can actually much better see where all the electrodes are positioned. For example, some here are on the frontal eye fields and here are these insular electrodes, you can actually see that they are there. And so when Harvey did this um, for the um, for these basis profile curves on the inflated brain, you can see that these purple sites are largely located on the uh, on the insula. You can see that better here and also on lateral temporal regions. And so the question now is how can we identify, like how reliable are these curves across subjects? Is this just unique in one subject or can we also extrapolate? And so we identified the consensus basis profile curves or consensus BPCs, which where consensus means that the waveforms are similar across subjects. And so when we have, for example, 44 basis profile curves recorded in several electrodes across five subjects, and we align all those basis profile curves up, we can do a principal component analysis on that. And here you can see the um, subject level BPCs with different colors by the different types of BPCs in a three-dimensional space. And we can cluster those based on clay means clustering into four clusters where you can see the shapes of those consensus basis profile curves below. Now we want to see where we stimulate when we elicit these waveforms across the subjects. And you can see that in the blue sites, the dark blue sites are, have different positions than the cyan sites compared to the green and the purple sites. And when we look at the stimulated, when we label the stimulated sites according to error, Areas. For example, we can see that the dark blue basis profile curves, that most electrodes were located in the hippocampus. When we elicit the cyan site, most electrodes are located in the amygdala. The lateral temporal evoking the green curve is mostly, yeah, the green curve is mostly um, elicited by stimulating the lateral temporal cortex. And the fourth one is a little bit of a mixture throughout, but mostly insula and several of the other sites. So we have these four types of connectivity profiles arriving in the collateral sulcus across subjects. And to see, and so the shared shapes, shapes seem to come from stimulating similar structures across patients. And so these really cluster anatomically. So to emphasize that showing in an MNI brain, showing the positions of the stimulated pairs, the centers, centroids of those, you can see that the hippocampus is, this, these are the hippocampal sites, both on the left and the right across different patients. You can see that the dark blue sites are mostly in hippocampus, whereas the cyan sites are mostly in the amygdala and the lateral temporal sites are mostly in green. And I show just a subset of the slides. And so the basis profile curve method allows creating connective field maps where we predict an electrophysiological connective field profile after stimulating another part of the brain, particular lateral temporal, more of the um, uh, um, where these different lateral temporal areas, amygdala hippocampus, and more insular and mixed sites. And we separate those from insignificant responses. And this um, paper is currently up on the bioarchive for uh, as a preprint. And so this may tell us about how different areas, when we when we measure in an area, how these that these are largely different projections to this particular site. So the take home points from this part. Um, cortical cortical evoked potentials or CCEPs have many different waveforms that are much more nuanced than just only this first um, uh, negative response or the N1 and 2. And a convergent paradigm where we focus on one particular area allows us to distinguish these multiple different uh, response shapes. Um, and these cluster together anatomically into electrophysiological connective field profiles for different types of connections. Here we can clearly cluster different types of limbic versus cortical inputs to the ventral temporal cortex. A stimulating limbic, so for example, hippocampus, amygdala, and cortical networks evoke different 
responses in the collateral sulcus. And that's also what makes sense anatomically that subcortical and cortical inputs, cortical cortical inputs have different types of responses. So this really makes sense in terms of anatomy. And given that confirmation, we can really start using this for um, more extensive studies across the types of connections in the human brain. Are there any questions about this? Okay, we have a few here. Okay, hi. Uh, Harvey was actually my classmate in college and I had no idea he was doing cool stuff like this. Um, so something I was wondering is uh, just related to this last point is uh, I'm wondering if there's any properties of uh, like properties of white matter that might, uh, as opposed to like the cell cytoarchitecture architecture that might be explaining different response profiles. So we, um... We are starting to go beyond, you know, we have like, we have only so much time when we see these patients and we have, so we generally can, within the time that we have, we can stimulate about 40 to 45 pairs of, 40 to 50 pairs of electrodes. Um, so we're trying to map as many types of inputs as we can within that time. Um, and in some of the, um, some of our recent studies, we are starting to also in combine this now with um, diffusion imaging, such that we can actually um, as better understand where our stimulated pairs are with respect to the white matter. Um, and then uh, also see whether we can stimulate, if we simulate different tracts specifically, whether that evokes different basis profile, ba different response curves. Um, so we are starting to uh, work on this, extending to, um, basically more anatomically driven types of inputs and going from the gray matter to the white matter um, to see how that also changes. There have been a few studies that show that white matter has different types, evokes different types of responses with respect to the gray matter. Um, and so those are things that we're currently looking into. Got it. Thanks. Looking forward to seeing uh, what comes out of that. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Hi, um, I was just wondering if there was any lateralization of the response, like, you know, if there was a difference between the right and left amygdala. So with our current sample, we don't have enough subjects to look at that, um, but that's exactly why we're building, where we're doing this across um, uh, across so many subjects. And so this is a sample of five subjects where we're trying to establish this particular, this feature in particularly. Uh, we're hoping that if we go, uh, if we have over 200 subjects uh, measured at different sites with a very similar comparable protocol, that we will actually be able to make those types of comparisons and compare left and right, uh, for example. But I think, you, we, yeah, I think we would need a lot of subjects to be able to establish those types of differences. Just um, like a little follow-up, would you expect there to be a difference? So there are some differences between the left and right that are known anatomically, for example, the, um, and this is uh, just from some of the work on, uh, that I have not been involved in from diffusion imaging, you often see that the right arcuate fasciculus is much less dense compared to the left arcuate fasciculus, for example. So those are the, um, the differences that I would expect uh, to also be reflected in these types of responses, uh, because the more we look at anatomy, the more these types of, um, and the more detailed we localize our electrodes to really be in the collateral sulcus and not a few millimeters over, um, the more consistent, um, you know, the more careful we are with our position, with our co-registration, um, the better, uh, the more consistent things are across subjects. So I think that there's the anatomy really will really drive these types of responses. So if there's an anatomical difference between the left and the right, yes, then I think there will also be a difference in these types of distributions. Thank you. Any other questions? One more. Hey Dora, um, I'm I'm wondering is could the this BPC analysis could it be translated to data that doesn't have stimulation? I'm sort of wondering, you know, you take an electrode, you look at when it's particularly active, and you 
consider that a stimulation and then you work from there through the same the same set of steps would that could that work uh or is it just too subtle i think um uh any um types of if you have a matrix with you'll we'll see in the demo that any type what the input to the analysis is a matrix with uh, responses of different types and if with different subtypes so we have we have say a uh, we stimulate 40 pairs and each of the, so we have 40 different types of inputs. And for each of the 40 types of inputs, we have 10 trials. So any matrix that has this structure, you can, we, you could potentially try that type of clustering as well. So if we have, for example, evoked responses for 40 visual images that are each repeated, we can try the same actually basis profile curve identification to see whether there's rough curves that differ across the stimuli. Great, thank you. And I think we have no more questions here uh, for now. So I think you can carry on. Thank you. So um, in order to do this across a large group of subjects, as I already mentioned, um, we have to have a database of, and you know, to be able to make comparisons across, across age, for example, across the lifespan, um, or across, for example, left and right. And we have to have a large database. And that's the goal of this project, to put that together. So we'll be sharing data as uh, papers come out. But in the end, we hope to have a, we already have like an over 200 CCP data sets that we're all putting in brain imaging data structure. And the reason why we're using the brain imaging data structure, um, or the reason why I first started looking into it is because it's um, if you have that much data, you need to be able to find where things are. If you are having cookies and you would like a cup of milk, we know that the milk is in the fridge. So if we have a large data set and we're looking for a sampling frequency, we want to know where that lives. And whereas some people may store it only in the data, other people may store it somewhere else. And we want to just have a consistent file and folder organization for, um, for neuroimaging data. And I first uh, started uh, looking into BIDS when we were doing a project where we were integrating uh, multimodal data with fMRI and intracranial EEG um, uh, and also uh, uh, other sites collected MEG or EEG or multi-electrode data. And we were trying to see how these signals are driven by different underlying um, neuronal populations and make models of that. And so at that point in time, BIDS was already developed for fMRI, um, and it was a shared structure for neuroimaging data. Metadata are human and machine readable, and it should fit most use cases. And so I was conveniently located one floor above um, Chris Gorolowski. So I went to talk to him and asked him how, um, whether, you know, what their ideas were of, you know, potentially extending this, et cetera. And, um, he told me several like practical things. This is just a practical structure for raw data. So not for data that are directly recorded of the device, but for raw data that we work with for analyses for, for organizations. So for example, for fMRI, not for DICOM data, but for the nifty images, for example, anatomical, functional, and diffusion-weighted images. They are stored in a set where we have a, a project with participants and things are stored at the participant or subject level. So every subject has a folder where all the data for a particular subject are stored because that's what the most labs typically worked with. Also, BIDS was um, uh, developed to be useful for many different types of analysis packages and there is involvement from the developers. For example, even like Brainstorm, um, Field Trip, EEG Lab, S. PM, Afni, Amatrix, FreeSurfer, many different online, um, many different app developers made apps to work with the data in bids. And as of uh, yesterday, there are many online available data sets um, available in bids on Open Neuro. So I only checked on Open Neuro, um, which has 723 public data sets. And so this is a community effort. It's not just one, one center doing one thing at a time. This is really something that is driven by the need from the community to store data practically. And so they had developed fMRI bibs. But at that point in time, there was also an, um, an effort from, a, um, from a Julian Niso to extend, and many others to extend MEG, to develop an MEG bids structure. And so we chose to develop together with um, Chris Holdgrab and a large 
working group of intra other intracranial EEG researchers, we extended a bit to intracranial EEG data. And so with many, with the help from many others, making sure that it fits most use cases, we extended um, the bids to IEG. Whereas another group at the same time uh, extended bids to EEG, and we made sure we were synchronized with those efforts, um, such that all the electrophysiology data types basically have overlapping representations where necessary. And there's other efforts extending bits, for example, to multi-electro data that are going on right now, or PET, or eye tracking. And so what does bits um, IEG look like? So we have our data, for example, in a project, we have a subject. And within that subject, we can have, for example, anatomy now, in addition to anatomical scans for, for MRI data, in addition to our IEG data. And one of the things that I would briefly like to emphasize with this rather extensive figure is that there are, so that we have the IEG data here that are accompanied by metadata that are all human readable. These are simple field value assignments. And from these data, we can reconstruct time traces, traces of the data with specific onsets. We stored events where those are linked to particular stimuli so that you can reproduce which stimuli were shown at which point in time. The electrode positions are stored with, in combination with the coordinate system so that you can actually visualize the electrode positions automatically when you have your data in bids for all the subjects. And so um, these are some of the websites that show information about the bids website specification extensively for all the different um, modalities, and then a starter kit that has some templates and a wiki um, to give people some, a way to start if they want to start putting their data in bids. And these uh, file names are easy to read. So they have subjects, sessions, et cetera, and optional labels for acquisitions, reconstructions, spaces, et cetera, but it's all human readable as well as extractable from the, um, uh, um, by pretty straightforward code. The JSON files have key value assignments that we can read, repetition time instruction, and those are all defined. And so when we use bits for these types of IEG data, we know that we're not skipping an important field that might be important actually to work with um, uh, when we are um, analyzing or writing up the data. Similar for um, the uh, tab-separated file formats for the um, for the events, for example, that have onsets and durations, um, and we can interpret these easily. Especially when working in the clinical environment, it's really nice that these um, uh, files are also human readable and not just extractable by a difficult package, um, because not everybody um, in the hospital can um, code as well as most of you can. There's an online bits validator as well, um, where you can validate your bits data set to make sure that it has all the required information in, uh, in the metadata and it meets the folder structure. So when working with bids, um, one of the uh, um, uh, things is that people often ask is how can I extend or contribute to bids? And a list of current extension proposals can be, uh, can be found at this website. And some of those, for example, include a connectivity data schema, eye checking data, or common electrophysiology derivatives. And within the common electrophysiology derivatives, so we're making some efforts to add annotations to our data because our data are collected in patients with epilepsy who sometimes have um, interictal activity during their stay. And if you're working with these data, you want to be able to exclude those or throw those out. So we're annotating all the data that we're collecting with additional um, information about which data was probably better to leave out. And this is one of the things that uh, Tal Palatia in my lab is working on to make these sure that these annotations are machine readable and in a standard. So she developed a um, hierarchical event descriptor schema library. Um, so AGD was one of these annotation formats developed by Scott McCaig and Kay Robbins, where we can actually add clinical EEG event descriptors in bits. Now this sounds complex perhaps, but what it does is that if you have these measurements with these time series that you can for a certain point, just assign a tag, a standard word, for example, saying that the patient was awake or that consciousness perhaps was affected. 
or for example, that there's low interictal activity or that they were in REM sleep, et cetera. And so what this looks like if we have an events file, you can here, for example, see that there's um, um, drowsiness, whether that existed, whether there's a general tonic tonic seizure, whether there are any interictal findings. And so this is a um, an straightforward way to tag data and to add a description that can then be read automatically from the data. And there is currently um, a um, uh, the schema. This, this particular description is up to look at artifacts, and there's, we have bits examples in the review that show how we can use those. So bits is practical and follows common lab workflows, and also is human and machine readable. There is a lot of community support for bids, so you're not just working by yourself on something that will never be used. It's actually a very large community that contributes, and it's extendable for everyone's purposes, um, where you can add information uh, for your part that's relevant for your particular data. So what I've shown today is that um, uh, we can work with um, bids in the setting of IEG to develop a database with a large number of CCEP data sets. And we can use these data for the basis profile curve identification to create connective field maps of inputs to human ventral cortex, for example. Um, we have, and now I would like to see the actually in practice part to map electrical stimulation connectives. So we can start with the demo. I will uh, take some time for questions. Um, and while I take time for questions, um, I would like people to also see whether they can want to start pulling up this uh, Jupyter notebook if they have the data already downloaded. Are there any caveats to bids? I've been only working with bids, but I uh, just wanted to kind of assess that in, in a way. So um, the caveat to bids is um, it's a lot of um, effort to make sure you store your data well in bids. Um, so it requires, uh, you can't just work on something. Uh, I mean, so my lab manager, my lab, my research technologist, uh, Gabby Ojeda, puts a lot of effort and time into making sure that all the data that we collect are converted to bids and have everything labeled. This is generally something that doesn't happen. I mean, this is not always something that happens on as large of a scale, um, but you have to have the conversions and everything in place to do that. Uh, some people prefer working with their own MATLAB format and don't um, necessarily want to do that, but it actually takes a lot of time and effort from the experiment on the experimental side, uh, where you make sure that all the information is correctly stored in bits and all the information is available. So that's basically the only downside if that's what you want to, <laughs> but it's also an upside, I think. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question is, um, it's interesting to, that um, the next steps include connectivity matrices. So in that, those are not uh, you know, raw data that's converted to a nifty file, which can be used with different softwares or something that's a you know, full program like, um, like free uh, fMRI prep or QSI prep or something. So what is the value of uh, a pre-processed data collection folder? Um, so, <laughs> um, so when I share raw EEG data, IEG data, there's many different ways in which um, I can re-reference those data. For example, the artifacts are specific for the site where we collected it. It depends on the amplifier that you have. Um, it depends on the, I mean, for some, for example, scan sequences may develop, may change, may differ in the types of um, field maps they acquired, motion correction they used, et cetera. For our data in our pre-processing pipelines, um, we make, we are very familiar with the data that we collect and we basically optimize our pre-processing data to have as clean of a data as possible. Now, for example, so this is one example. So we may, if we work with another researcher who is just interested in connectivity matrices or running one particular piece of code, we may just share the pre-processed data so that they don't have to go through the same learning curve um, with, for example, different re-referencing schemes, like are you going to look at bipolar re-referencing? Um, there are issues with common average re-referencing that you have to address if you don't want to introduce signals from one electrode onto the other. 
where is the noise shared across shafts, across amplifiers, across connectors? There's all this details, experimental knowledge um, that we can share through sharing a derived data set where we describe what type of pre-processing is done in addition to our pipeline. Now that's one F, that's one, one way to see it. The other way, the other reason for sharing derived data is that um, ethically, some labs are not allowed to share the raw data. And so in some cases, it may only be possible to publicly share some of the derived data rather than the data from individual subjects. Thank you. Okay. So I'll give you guys a brief break to get your uh, electro your, your computers out while and um, so I'm going to pull up the um uh Jupyter notebook. Um can you guys see my Jupyter notebook? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So this Actually, Jupyter could notebook. You, sorry, could you make the text just a little bigger? Great, thank you. I don't know if I can just zoom in or actually make it bigger on the... I think if you push uh, Command Plus, it will zoom in. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so just as a note on this, um, we I often develop my code in MATLAB. Um, so I often still use MATLAB. So this Jupyter notebook was really uh, written by the help of Tal Palatia and Harvey Wong um, to make sure that uh, it would also be more usable and shareable in this manner. But that makes it such that the code is available both in, within this Jupyter notebook and um, as well as in the uh, in MATLAB code that is also shared with the with the publication. Um, one of the things that is good to get started with uh, is setting up the environment. So I just I already ran this um, uh, this shell to set my environment, and you can see here on the top right that my kernel is a uh, BPC. So if people are walking along, make sure your kernel is the. Uh, for example, if you have to switch kernels, it's a BPC kernel, and that makes it such that all the required packages are run. It works with uh, data downloaded from Open Neuro. So um, if you want to run along, um, these are the data on Open Neuro, and that's what it works with. So if these basic things are set up, we have to make sure we import um, our dependencies. And um, um, so this is just to set up our environment. And then we have to enter the path to our bits data set, which in our case, uh, which is my case, I put the data on the desktop and I can just make sure, and I just made sure that this ran so the data are located. Um, and this is where I downloaded this data set from Open Neuro. So um, the um, uh, initial layout, you can see for, if we run this part, we're starting to work with data in bits. And you can see that this is where I downloaded the data. There's one subject, one session, and one run. And we can see the names of the subjects in this in this uh, in this data set. This particular subject, O1. So here we can define which subject we are going to analyze. Subject one, session one, CCP data, run one. Electrodes are in MNI space. And so we're going to use. Um, Uh, we're going to um, to get all the information for the data, channels, events, and electrodes. So those are the different parts of the data that are stored within bids. We always have the data, the, the metadata, JSON file, etc. And so here you can see which data set I'm loading. And so this is a MEF3 data set, which is you know the data set that we store, one of the bids um, supported data sets that we store most of our data in. And then we can see, look, let's look at some of the files that we have. So these are all the metadata related to this particular IEG data set. So for example, we can see that the channels.tsv have channel names on them, the type of electrodes. So these are ECOG surface electrodes, units, what type of um, filters were used, low pass filters, high pass filters. There's an intracranial reference 
we don't store NANDs, the data are sampled at 2048 hertz. No notch is applied, and these channels are good. We may also have some bad channels, which we can put in the um, which we can put in here a little, and then describe why they are bad. So this is just some of the bids information that we can easily now pull now that we have the data and bids from the files. Then we can see these are the onsets in seconds of the stimulation and the duration, which is you can see 200 microseconds. So the duration is in um, uh, in the order of seconds. You can see the trial type, electrical stimulation, and the samples at which things you can add other information, but this is the required information on the duration. And then we can also see in a different file, we have electrode positions. And so you can see the name of the electrode, XYZ position, hemisphere, different labels, according to the free server atlas that we save for these electrodes. One of the things that was essential when we developed bits, and that's an interesting note here, is that we have a file that's called electrodes and one file that's called channels. Electrodes are the hardware contacts that are placed in the brain with a certain position. So those are the contacts, the measurement surfaces. So they have a location and a size, et cetera. These can be different, not necessarily in this case, they're the same, but they can be different from measurement channels because we assign these positions to a type of input in our amplifier. And for example, if we were to do a, bi uh, a bipolar referencing scheme in the hardware, there would not be an intracranial reference, but this and this would, name would change. So here you can see some of the basic layout in um, of bids. Are there any questions here? Looks like you can keep going. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So let's render some of the um, uh, the brain surfaces to see where we where our electrodes are. And so this renders all the electrode positions from the electrodes or TSV file on the brain surface. And here you can see the labels and that are assigned to each of these positions. So you can see, for example, LPS one, two, three. So those are strips. You can see a grid laying here. Some of the gray electrodes were bad quality. So we excluded those from analysis. So there's gray, they're rendered in gray. For example, here you can see some of the LTG1 to 8, and this is generally one of the standard naming schemes that is assigned by the clinic for, for all these measurements. So I'm going to keep this open because we can select for which electrode we want to look at the inputs. For example, at one of these ventral temporal electrodes that I have a particular interest in. And so here we can choose which electrode we would like to see. And if you have, if you're running along and you have a different electrode here, you can, for example, change this to LMS2, which is what I would, one of the ones that I find particularly interesting because it's right here on the ventral temporal cortex. So we select the electrodes that we, for which we want to extract the basis profile curves. And so we extract the relevant metadata, such as the sampling frequency, the time, the number of trials to include, et cetera. And so this just as a check, this just prints the sampling frequency in, um, and we can see that it's 2000 hertz. Now I'm going to start running the cell below because it takes a while to load all the data and re-reference the, uh, and, and do the re-referencing to uh, calculate the CCPs. And I'll just reiterate the convergent framework that we um, uh, that we look at in this case. So we're just well, we're so we're loading the data from when we're stimulating all these different pairs and measuring in this one site, LMS two. We're loading the data from minus one to two seconds after before and after stimulation onset. So we have this. So we get this matrix with effort response sheet. One of the things to note is that, so this is in particular for the convergent paradigm, which this would be different for the divergent paradigm where we stimulate pairs and look at all the responses in all others.
Uh, one so of Dora, the oh, sorry, one, yeah. one second. I think a few of the students are having trouble getting the uh, demo to work. And unfortunately, I don't have my laptop in front of me, so I can't debug it. But I suspect that it has to do with the fact that the uh, the paths to the data are different for us than for you. So um, I believe it's in slash shared slash uh, the open neuro. The notebook that is on the hub is supposed to have the path to our version of the data. If you're not seeing the viewer that she saw, there's a fix for that, which I'm putting in Slack right now. So uh, if, if there's a slight change to the code to see the view, oh, sorry. I'll... If you're not seeing the viewer that Dora uh, showed in her browser, I will post the fix in just a second there into that channel about um, how to see that viewer in line in Jupyter Lab. coming in a minute. Thanks for our troubleshooting, Ariel. Did that uh, work for people? Okay, I see some thumbs up, so it uh, seems like it's working. Thank you. So one of the so and by now this is uh, this is run that and one of the things that is um, good to note here is that the re-referencing is tailored to the particular data that we collected, which is one of the things I just mentioned. Like why would we want to share? I mean this we can share this first first of all in a notebook like this how we pre-process our data, but in some cases you may just want to look at the pre-processed data, and um, uh, just be able to run away uh, with the calculations and so there's two different ways to do that um, and this is particularly tailored to our data such that we get rid of the noise there have been some changes and um, since we developed this notebook um, uh, which we'll be fixing over time now let's plot what we actually calculated just to see what we're doing so i'm um, we're doing a baseline subtraction so one of the things that we have here is we have just all the trials and these are all the measured sites or all the measured data in, in um, this particular area, LMS2. And so here we see the matrix for trials number 400 and up. I'll scroll down a little bit. The one on the left is not baseline corrected. And so what that means is that we did not subtract a baseline. So you can see that here there is some baseline activity for these electrodes. And we set that to which we should set set to zero because we assume that before we stimulate nothing much is going on, and so here you can see clearly that there's only response after the stimulus and there is no offset before that. And so in this notebook, you can easily turn that on or off and see what the effect would be on your data if you were to do something or miss one of these steps or do something different. And so this is each stimulation trial. So you can see here, for example, that these trials are likely of the same stimulation pair. These ones look very similar. These ones look very similar, etc. You can see negative deflections here in blue, positive deflections in, in yellow. So you can already see that there is different stimulation pairs producing these different types of responses. And based on this matrix, we can now start calculating the basis profile curves to cluster these together, because we can also see, for example, that this looks very similar, similar to this, and that looks very similar to that, and we want to cluster that and maintain, for example, the polarity. So we calculate this, the convergent matrix, which is basically V pre. This is what we put baseline corrected. And we choose a time that we want to, for which we want to analyze the data. And in this case, we can see that we 
for example, we have shorter responses and longer responses. And in this case, just for the example, we'll choose the first second. But if we start a little bit, 15 milliseconds after electrical stimulation, because for the first 15 milliseconds, there's, a, there's maybe some artifacts from the stimulation in the data. So we start at 15 milliseconds and go up to one second. And then we're going to project all these trials into each other and see and calculate our significance matrix. Oh, wait, I have to first do this, make sure I run this part. And here you can see the significance matrix. And here you can see this is clustered by subgroup or stimulation pair. So you can already see here that stimulation pair zero is very similar to stimulation pair number two or stimulation pair number 10. And now we're going to use the um, non-active matrix factorization to cluster the sites that produce similar measured responses. And here we can see that in the end, we have three basis profile curves. And the off diagonal score, which is what it iterates towards, is then below, is the first moment when that's below one. So if you would like to allow more shit more variants overlapping between your basis profile curves this is what you should change this you can set, change the threshold or you can calculate it in a different way rather than the sum taking the maximum etc now each stimulation pair is only assigned to one cluster so we think for every stimulation site that it can only elicit one type of response, even if it were on, you're stimulating two electrodes, so it might be stimulating two different pathways, we only assign it to one cluster and leave the shared, you know, multiple pathway stimulation for the future. So we assign every subgroup to one cluster and we can identify the basis profile curves. And we can see here which stimulation pairs are assigned to which basis profile curves. We have three basis profile curves. These are the st stimulation pairs, so the numbers that are assigned to each. And then we can plot them. We can see that we have three different response shapes. One, that is the characteristic, and one and two shape. Another one that doesn't have the really have the first response, but more of a one slower negative response and one that's the opposite, that's positive, but all measured in the same sites. Are people getting this? Sounds, sounds like they're getting different data um, here, but it's, it's producing the plots. Okay, yes, yeah, so I changed in this example, I changed some of the, in the default example that's on the server, I changed some of these, um, like you can change this time and you can change the electrode we're looking at. And I think by default, it might be looking at LMS3 and it might be uh, looking at a smaller or a larger, I'm, I'm not sure if the window is the same as well. And what you can do then is that, and then in some cases, um, and then you can further test for how significant, how significant, of course, each of those is. I know it's some for some of the different sites. There's sometimes there's BPCs that are not as clear or uh, you know as other things, but that'll be and that'll be reflected in the size of the electrodes, the spatial representation, which you can see here. So you can see from our measured site here in black that some of the sites here in blue that correspond to this blue basis profile curve have this, you know, some are more reliable. And then there's others where we can still see a little dot, but it's not, probably wouldn't meet significance if we were to calculate that um, or wouldn't meet our threshold for explained variance. Same in green and in orange. And so we can see these um, spatial representations and we can then 
change the time intervals and look at different types of inputs and run over the same things. Are there any questions? And otherwise I can show one other example. Uh, looks like you can go ahead with the example. Okay. Okay. So we see that we have all these different examples here. And for example, we can look at one of these depth electrodes because we only, because, you know, we've seen now in the previous talk that it's also applicable there. Um, but it's interesting to, for example, look at this uh, side, for example, um, uh, one of these depth electrodes that you can see here um, that are closer to the, um, these electrodes were placed around um, a small tumor here in this patient. Um, and so we can, for example, look at, um, say, LSD number two. And we can start making some, changing some things and making some mistakes and see how things go. But let's first look at another example. So we just go back to section number three, pre-sublessing data, and we change this to LSD number two. Sorry, just and to clarify, um, the, the patient with the tumor, did you uh, move your, uh, shift your locations uh, to not cover the lesion area? Sorry, I just missed it. So in um, uh, the electrodes are typically covering the lesion area because in this case, you can see that the electrodes are placed on the left. This was a left-handed coverage. Okay. Um, and this, so this location was potentially close to, um, close to Wernicke's area. Okay, understood, thank you. The reason why this patient was monitored is because there was also, um, you know, because there was a tumor and the patient also had epilepsy close to, from the areas spreading around the tumor. So there's many different um, interesting aspects here from a um, clinical perspective, um, in addition to, um, you know, but now we're looking just at the signal changes just to, to see how things um yeah, that's actually quite interesting. One of my projects was looking at dendritic spines and uh, looking at the plasticity of those and how that progresses to tumor uh, and progression due to seizure generation, which is a recent development. Um, I think Bankatish, uh, Bankatish uh, in 2017 published a paper on that. So that's why I'm asking about lesioned uh, studies. Yeah, it's definitely one of the things we would like to test in the future. So that's one of the, that's really interesting to... Um... To consider, and so um, we just pull the electrode for this elect for this electrode. We just pull the relevant information. Um, we load the data, so you can see it runs through all the data, all the single trial simulation. We do the common average referencing to get rid of the common noise. And it always takes a little bit, um, little bit of time to run. Of note, by the way, the code to some of the code to work with these um, F3 data highly efficiently um, in our lab is being uh, um, developed by Max van der Boom, who's in the audience right now with you. So it will be, um, if you have any questions on that, you can ask him as well. And the reason why this takes long is because these are 2000 Hertz about, you know, um, can be up to 256 channels. In this case, it's less than that, but it um, takes a while to load hour and a half long of data or up to an hour and a half. And so we can plot our matrix for this electrode. And you can see it looks very different for this electrode to, compared to what we had before. Mm -hmm. So you can see that this matrix is, a, yeah, it, it's just, it's, 
um, it varies a lot from site to site. And we can already see some of these profiles. We can already see the first negative followed by positive, only positive. And then I will have to see whether this, whether this one with the second negative response really pulls out as being separate or not. And again, responses last from about zero to one second. So that's a time period that we're interested in, starting at 15 milliseconds. Hmm. Calculating our significance matrix. And we see that in a large block of a in a commonly varying um, patterns. We do um, non-negative matrix factorization. In this case, we get two components, which is what we kind of saw in the data. Have a winner take all. And identify our basis profile curves. So we can see there's two basis profile curves which have the shapes that we could already see in the, in the data. One that is similar to the negative, positive, negative, and the other is the positive. So the negative and the positive. And then we can look at the spatial representation of these data. And we can see that around the stimulation electrode, we basically see a large effect of whether we're stimulating right there or right there, just right above or right below. So we have to, there's a very, um, but it's not necessarily a straight line like that. There is some, there's an anatomical distinction between those different pairs. So we can see that the clusters emerge from the data in an automated fashion. So for the last five minutes, um, I am happy to take uh, any more questions. It just showed that, um, that EEG is a very valuable um, clinical pipeline uh, thing to include uh, in, in several instances. It's very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're yeah, we're not seeing uh, questions. I just I just thought I'd mention that Dora will actually be here next week in Seattle, uh, right here in Alder Commons. And um, so, if if there are further things you'd like to discuss with Dora breakouts you'd like to her to do, that would be an opportunity during the breakouts next week. I think we do have one question here, one second. Hi, so in thinking about like future plans about how to integrate this with some kind of, uh, M kind of MRI mode, such as diffusion, as you mentioned earlier, is there a good interface for, for example, I, I, these electrodes are on the surface, so is there a good interface with like a free surfer reconstruction, for example, in order to kind of bridge this connection between uh, our electrode placement to somewhere where we can work with MRI data? Uh, so a question, do you mean in the same patients or different patients? Uh, within a patient. Within a patient. Yes, so uh, we're developing the uh, tools for that right now to really map. So every you can see every electrode here has an X, Y, and Z position that matches an individual MRI, MRI or in this case it's an um, in this case it's the uh, MRI space. But we originally, in order to get there, we have to get there from an MRI. And so these electrode positions um, basically indicates which area we're measuring from. We have before used those match the signals from these electrodes, for example, to fMRI data measured in the same patients by match matching these up. And they're very, um, you know, there's several different ways in which we can integrate those data. For diffusion imaging data, for example, we can look at an area around an electrode and see which 
track they're located close to if we combine it with uh, and we're currently developing the methods for that we just had a poster um, at OHBM um, uh, where we show how the basically some of the guidelines into how to integrate this with the fusion imaging data um, uh, which was developed which was done by uh, Talpal at TM. Here you can also see that every electrode has a um, uh, is labeled according to a um, according to the Destrio atlas, so according to a free surfer atlas. So every electrode is assigned to a you know has a has a certain position, and we extract the most common free surfer label within a certain radius around the electrode. So for stereo EEG, we look within three millimeters, for example. Okay. Okay, uh, so is there any way that these electrodes are then mapped to free surfer vertices, for example, like in, in like the triangular meshes, or or do you tend to keep it in this the X Y Z uh, format? So we easily we we basically dynamically go back and forth between those. Um, Dependent on the project, and we have, um, we it's a, we we have we are planning to release all these tools basically to do that. So, for example, um, in this uh, in this case, uh, what I showed here is that the um, the electrodes are matched in this case to the surfaces. So they have an X Y Z position. For that X Y Z position, we find the vertex that's closest to the electrode. So we have an, a vertex, and so within that vertex, we can just inflate the brain and then. Um, and then we have a vertex position or a vertex number, a vertex index, rather than an, um, an XYZ position. So we have all these tools. Um, so we're making all these tools available in, uh, in mostly in MATLAB code, but also in some of the, um, uh, if people want to use Python in my lab, that's also, um, that's also happening. So we have, we have multiple things available such that we can really start dynamically integrating this with the same measurements in a with different modality measurement in the same patient. Yeah, got it. Thanks. That looks great. Thanks. And for what it's worth, uh, if anyone is interested in doing something with this, I actually have Python code that will convert those MNI coordinates into free server uh, vertices. Uh, any other questions? The, um, I have one question with DTI, uh, which is also very interesting, but um, often is criticized for uh, its valuation measures with FA or uh, maybe MD, poss possibly, or mostly FA. Um, so do you run into, how are you resolving those issues? Are you, and are you using FreeSurfer with this or FSL or maybe, maybe something else? I don't know. For um, so this this uh, the surface rendering is developed with our MATLAB code. I'm happy to share the link. Um, it's on our basic mm -hmm. MATLAB package. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, integration with, for example, FreeSurfer FSL. Uh, so if it's be integrated with FreeSurfer, but um, so FreeSurfer is run on all the patient MRI T1 MRI data. The um, in our lab, we don't particularly use FSL, but we use QSI prep to pre-process the data. So there's a different, to, to, to integrate all these pipelines um, with the different data processing, as long as you at some point have the coordinates, you can just map for each particular voxel, you can see where things are and then map things to tracts. But that's one of the things that we're putting a lot of effort into is to, um, uh, to think how to integrate those data smoothly based on um, different workflows that people use and to make it as dynamic as possible, such that if someone lab is using AFNI or another lab is using FSL or say MRTRIX or SPM, that they can all use the electrode positions to get the information in the end. I see. Um, so you're basically eradicating, or not eradicating, but uh, looking at naughty. That's what you're looking at, right? No. Or so in this case, for the, uh, for when we're doing fiber tracking in our case, uh, we're, um, we can start looking at fiber properties, but we're um, the first thing that you have to know if you are have an electrode, for example, if you want to look at the properties of that fiber bundle, if you want to know which fiber bundle it's in. Now, if we use different packages, an electrode can either be in the unsonet, in the arcuate fasciculus, or in both, or it can be close to a cingulum bundle because all of those run very close together. And mm -hmm. so if we really want to understand where an electrode is positioned, if we're thinking about white matter, we really have to think first about what's influencing 
those differences and to assign it reliably to certain bundles. And that's what we presented at OHBM. Okay. I'm happy to share the poster. Yeah, um, can you sh can you share that poster? That would be great. On the, I can post it on the Slack channel. Yeah, thank you. Great. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, we're uh, basically at time. So why don't we thank our speaker? Thank you, Dora, for this great talk. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. That was great. Thank you. All right, so uh, at this point we have our break for lunch, so we will see all of you back here at uh, 1.30 for... Data lab. Data. Right. So yeah, at 1.30 we'll be uh, discussing data lab.